and waterways. I just love all of the little moments out on the river, all the little snapshots of life. I'm visiting old friends. Baby elephants, very playful. <laughs> and meeting local heroes. <laughs> She's really not happy with me. <laughs> to discover this country's unique connection to water. <laughs> How do I go turn the other way? In a whole new way. I've visited a lot of places in Thailand, and honestly, I didn't even know a place like this existed. I'm starting my trip at the perfect time. I'm in the middle of the world's largest water festival on Khao San Road in Bangkok. Song Khan, as it's known, marks the start of the Thai New Year and of the rainy season. For three days every April, the entire country shuts down to engage in a nationwide water fight. And it's a great mix of people, young Thai people, tourists from all over the world. <laughs> It's easy to see why Song Khan is Thailand's most popular festival. I want to go and check out the more traditional side of Song Khan to get a better sense of the importance of water to people here in Thailand. I'm at King Rama II Memorial Park. And I'm here because this is where families celebrate a more traditional side of Songkran. This centuries-old festival goes back to the roots of the Thai people. Tied to farming communities, it was a time to give thanks for a good harvest and to mark new beginnings. So this is how I imagine Songkran like a hundred years ago. This is a song a rice farmer is singing. He's trying to flirt with the girl that he likes. This is the original way of celebrating the Thai New Year, where water is used as a symbol for both cleansing and renewal. And then ask for a blessing. Yeah. Water is also used to honor one's elders and get their blessings in return. <laughs> it's great to be able to compare and contrast traditional Songkran and what Songkran has become for a lot of people. That's the way Thailand is. In Thailand, you get this great mix of tradition and contemporary ways of celebrating. And it's all connected to water, the essence of life. I first came to Thailand in the 1990s to study freshwater fish. I spent a lot of time on rivers, traveling up and down rivers. And it was clear to me how connected people here are to rivers and water. And that's why I've come back. I'm going to travel Thailand's two major waterways, starting south at the Chao Phraya River and then north to the mighty Mekong, before I end my journey back at the source and the heart of Thailand's central plains. I want to understand what rivers mean to Thai people and how they have influence and are still influencing people's day-to-day -day lives. And the first place to start is the capital. Like any big city, Bangkok has its share of roads, traffic, street lights, and skyscrapers. But believe it or not, in the beginning, Bangkok's highways weren't made of concrete.
miles on the river every day. My friend doesn't live on the river. <laughs> Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop pulling tap. Stop pulling tap. Seems like this is the side of Bangkok that most people don't see. Yes, life here is still a bit like it was in Bangkok about 30 years ago. Uh, in other words, boats are still used to get into these areas that the roads don't reach. It's their principal form of uh, transportation. Steve spent over 11 years living by the river and has seen how water permeates every facet of life here. Water is the lifeblood of the ties. If you understand the importance of water in the development of Thailand's agriculture, its commerce, its history, etc., and if you look at water values as they take place in daily life and such, I think you have a pretty good understanding of who the Thais are and what's important to them. I can see why Bangkok was once called the Venice of the East. Most of the city once consisted of a labyrinth of canals that were built hundreds of years ago. Thais recognized early on was that instead of being an obstacle, water could actually be a facilitator of economic growth, of, uh, transportation. Today, these canals have all the modern amenities of a normal city. From postal services, to even floating banks. But population growth, urbanization, and pollution have taken a toll on the health of the river, negatively impacting communities and marine life. And not many of these canals have survived. Most of the canals were paved over to make roads. Once we went to road transport, we kind of turned our backs on the river. Though there are communities here who still cherish and celebrate this rivering way of life. I just love all of the little moments out on the river, all the little snapshots of life. Tons of people fishing, kids playing in the water. I mean, literally hundreds of moments, little moments like that, that just make you smile. Thailand's waterways aren't just a conduit for transport and trade. The rivers themselves are also a source of sustenance. And even in some of the most inhospitable places, Thais have managed to find ways to harvest from the land. I'm heading southwest to an intersection where the rivers meet the sea. This place is a hot, muddy swampland. And the salt levels in these intertidal zones would kill an ordinary plant in hours. But it's in these mangroves where something remarkable happens. On previous research trips, I've caught everything from giant freshwater stingray to small black tip reef sharks right in this region. It's one of the most biologically rich and complex ecosystems on Earth. Over the last 20 years, the local community here has actively been replanting mangrove forests that were once cleared for development. And as the forest has come back, life in this area has come back too, and with the life, people's livelihoods. During high tide, this entire area is underwater. Even so, local people have found some ingenious ways to make use of this piece of real estate. And it all happens at low tide. As the ocean waters recede, they leave behind mudflats that extend far out to the horizon. Impossible to cross by boat or on foot. People here use these giant wooden skis or surfboards. The same way that you might use snowshoes to move across the snow, people use these big boards to mud surf, to move across the mud to collect small clams. Clams are a vital source of income for the community here, and an amazing example of how ties use the river systems both during the dry and the wet season. 
and I'm gonna find out just how it's done. Okay, let's give this a try. Time to get dirty. So, surfboard in the mud, pail to collect clams. Oh, like ah, that. Okay. Oh, my leg, my leg, my legs are all long. Ah. Here, okay. feet here. Okay. Just go. Oh. <laughs> Wait, how do I go? Turn the other way. Okay, okay. Good. 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 Oh, I thought it was going to be easy. It's difficult to turn. Watch the professional do it. Oh, there we go. It's like swimming in a big bowl of chocolate pudding. How do you find where the clams are? How do you know? So I'm just looking for holes, and then where there's a hole, feel down. Oh, oh. Got one. I found one. Ah! ah. Reaching down in the hole, more often than not, I didn't get a clam, I got a crab. And I grabbed onto the crab, it grabbed onto me. Ah! <laughs> Gotta watch where I put my fingers. <laughs> the clams were collected in Thailand's inner tidal zone. area it seems so inhospitable just thick thick mud and to think that people make a living out here collecting 20 pounds of clams on one low tide that's pretty impressive the tide is coming in so we head back to shore to wash and count our catch How much can you sell these for? Lola uh, Tarai Cup? 100 baht. 100 baht. So about 100 baht. So about th $3 for one kilo. I've only collected half that, $1.50 on the market. But now that my work's done, it's time to cool off. This whole location has become a destination for eco tourists. People that come out, they want to see them store mangrove. They want to see the monkeys. They want to play in the mud. And even the surfboards, they found a way to use them not only for work, but also to have a good time. <laughs> After hearing what's happened out here, it's a real success story. Families moving from cities back out here to start ecotourism businesses. Just goes to show me how resilient these mangrove ecosystems can be if given half a chance. Next, I'm hitching a ride on the river to the ancient capital of Ayutthaya. The Chao Phraya is Thailand's principal river system, and it's helped shape Thai civilization. Kingdoms were founded on its shores, and the river connected ancient cities. Royal barges were the equivalent of the horse and carriage for Thai kings. Artisans typically handcrafted these 130-foot-long boats from a single teak tree, adorning them with gold lacquer and glass jewels. Originally built as warships over seven centuries ago, today they are used in official state ceremonies, and one has even been declared a maritime world heritage. The river was also the main highway for commerce and trade. For centuries, barges like this have been transporting construction materials like sand and gypsum, and goods like sugar and rice up and down Thailand's rivers. 
These rivers were the economic superhighways of the pre-20th century, and barges like these helped build the country. I want to find out why these barges are still needed today. So I figured the best way is to jump on board one. First thing I saw when I get on the barge is a dog. And I guess he's feeling territorial because I'm on his boat. Now that we're all loaded up, we have a long, slow journey ahead of us. It's going to take us over 20 hours to cover just 62 miles. Which is pretty crazy if you think about it, because a truck could cover that same distance in about two hours. We're heading toward the city of Ayutthaya. Only 100 years ago, this river was filled with thousands of barges. Nowadays, as roads become the more popular method of transportation, the barges are dying out. I wanted to ask Steersman Pramod what kinds of goods he carries and why. And so people still use the river like they did before. <laughs> I guess it makes sense. You can move more goods more cheaply if you're not in a rush. Pramod lets me have a go at the wheel, but not before a crash course in towing three 92-foot-long barges carrying over a 1,000 tons of soil. What happens if I need to stop the barges? If I turn the wrong way, I have to stop the barges. How do I stop them? He <laughs> says, no break. <laughs> so you imagine all of that weight, all of the inertia, it's impossible to stop. So go slow, just drive slow, be patient. Yes, <laughs> yes. How long have you been driving the barge? With only a paddle, it's a 400-mile journey that back then would have taken over a month. Today, Pramot lives a waterborne life, much like his parents and grandparents did. It's a solitary lifestyle, and he could be the last of his family legacy. Is that your daughter? In the middle. What are your kids doing now? In college? Do you think your children will take over? I'm curious to understand what motivates him to keep doing this. What do you like about being on the boat? You know, being out there, I got a sense for what that life is like. In many ways, life on the river is like taking a step back in time. Things seem more calm, more relaxed. Life seems to move at a slower pace. And that, that feels good. Having said that, I need to reach Ayutthaya before dark. So I say my goodbyes to Pramod and hop on a slightly faster mode of transport. Barges transported materials up and down rivers and helped build the Thai nation. But once goods got to port, there were no trucks or cars to get materials to their final destination. So people looked for the biggest, strongest thing they could find, elephants. I want to get a sense for just how these mighty pachyderms helped build the Thai nation. So I helped the Mahouts. We brought a few elephants down the river for their evening bath. Uh. <laughs> lower pace and that that feels good 
Having said that, I need to reach Ayutthaya before dark. So I say my goodbyes to Pramod and hop on a slightly faster mode of transport. Barges transported materials up and down rivers and helped build the Thai nation. But once goods got to port, there were no trucks or cars to get materials to their final destination. So people looked for the biggest, strongest thing they could find, elephants. I want to get a sense for just how these mighty pachyderms helped build the Thai nation. So I helped the Mahouts. We brought a few elephants down the river for their evening bath. Uh. <laughs> elephants, they're just these massive, intelligent animals. There's just something about an animal that big and that strong that uh, you have to respect. Changi, are you tall? Baby elephants, just like uh, young humans. Very playful. Love the water. <laughs> Even though we might criticize it now, I can see how these elephants were essential to moving heavy goods. Nothing else in their day could beat them. In Northern Thailand, the logs would be cut and elephants would carry them down to the river. The logs would be floated all the way down to Bangkok, a journey that could take up to five years. When Thailand banned logging in the late 1980s, the elephants and their mahouts were left without a source of income. And there was a problem until recently in Thailand. The mahouts would take elephants into big cities and keep them up long hours, a lot of times all night, to beg for food from tourists. So the camp that I visited rescued elephants from unhealthy situations and provided them with the food and the care that they need to keep them healthy. Considering there aren't a lot of other alternatives, it's one solution. It's the late rainy season in Ayutthaya, Thailand, and surrounding this ancient capital is another key reason why the Thai kingdom thrived. Rice is at the center of life in Thailand. This ancient grain has shaped the history, the culture, and the economy of this country. I'm heading out to the central floodplains to find out how these rice fields provide a seasonal bounty. All of this fertile land around me is part of the Chao Praya River Basin. And these fields produce enough to feed almost half the Thai population. But it's not just rice you can find in these fields. I met a woman named Mali who offered to show me how to catch fish out of rice fields. Yeah, sounds crazy. Fish in fields. The first step was to catch small frogs. No. Got it, I got it. We were running through the mud, looking for small frogs. There were little frogs in the mud on the edge of the water, and Molly was just yelling at me. But it was harder than it looked. They're so sneaky, aren't they, Molly? <laughs> Molly's teaching me how to catch bait, the bait that she uses for snakeheads, and this is one of the snakeheads' favorite prey. But she's really not happy with me. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> How many frogs do we need for bait? <laughs> we, got, we have five. She said that we need at least 20. Says I'm not good way. We finally got enough frogs to start fishing. It's very simple, just a small piece of bamboo, a string, and a hook. And Mali makes these herself at home. 
เราจะเผ็ดไงแล้วเราก็นี่ไงสวัสดีบ๊ายบายแล้วเราก็ปักเป็ดไม่ต้องให้เขียดจมน้ำ We're fishing for snakehead. It's one of the more common fish in the rice field. It'll sneak up. It'll sense the movement of the prey of these frogs on the surface of the water, and to ambush predators. So it'll sense the movement and then strike. Mali, the snakeheads, aroy, my. Aroy. Aroy. The whole process is just so simple. Molly is someone she doesn't have a lot of resources, and yet she's come up with a way to get the food that she needs, both for her family and to sell, from very simple instruments. Because when we cut the fish, they've been fishing for years, right? So when we cut the fish, we cut it according to the time that they came. If there's water, there's a lot of fish. Because it's not hot. It's not hot. Mali saying, during the rainy season, all of these areas are connected from the river to the rice fields, and the fish that she relies on spread out all over the rice fields. So it's that cycle of the rainy season that connects most of the lands around here. And it looks like we finally got a bite. It's amazing to me that we've just hooked a fish. In the middle of a rice field in Thailand. Oh, big one! There we go. Uh, so look at that. So a striped snakehead. This is one of the most common rice field fish, and this one's over a foot long. Molly says that in a night, she can catch 10, or in a good night, even 20 of these striped snakeheads. Good catch. It's a good one. มีความสุขไหมมีความสุขจ้ะ Look out. In the bag. Should go check the other, the other rods. Bah. You know, think of all the things that she's getting from the water. She's getting fish, the rice, frogs, snails, crabs, shrimp, all supplied to her from the small bit of land that she has, and from the river and the water. It really goes to show. That even floods are turned into something positive here. The abundance and diversity of fresh food from Thailand's rivers has given rise to one of the most famous cuisines in the world. I've asked local resident Rapi Udomrat to show me how some of these wetland ingredients are used by her family. It looks like we have some typical ingredients for Thai food: garlic. Shrimp paste and pepper, eggplant. Egg this is basil. Basil. We use a lot of chili. Oh. <laughs> I love eating spicy food, but I I don't do so good with it. So okay, show me what to do. First, you start with pepper. Pepper. Chili. Kapila. Kaffir lime. Yeah. It smells like Thai food. Yes. <laughs> smells good. Are these all the ingredients that you can grow in your garden? Yes. We have a little garden in almost every house. We can fry in uh, the backyard. Almost everything. Don't have to pay for. I don't think most people realize. Certainly, even for me, people living along the water have access to all different kinds of spices, all different kinds of vegetables and fruits. All. Right there in their backyard, and when families harvest more than they can, the river itself provides the space to sell it. When we almost f i n i s h we feel sticky. Yeah, it feels sticky now. Yeah. You like to try it? Sure. Oh, is it spicy? Yeah. A bit, m o t Thai. p l a n I don't know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, mm. spicy. <laughs> <coughs> Let's start cooking. What makes Thai food special? เพราะว่ารสชาติอาหารไทยแต่ละอย่างต่างกันหวาน
Some of the ingredients we're using are only available in this season. Sit now. It's done? Yeah. Mm. Very good, yeah. <laughs> we're heading out to have our meal on a boat with Rapi's aunt. I want to find out how families here utilize this seasonal bounty. Uh, some curry. Enough, thank you. <laughs> Were there a lot of fish in the river back then? <laughs> she has some great stories about what it was like living on the river when she was younger. There were so many fish and crabs and shrimp that they would get tired of catching them. Too many to eat. There's some simple ingenuity to life here. People harnessing the river, channeling the rice fields, learning how to get food from around their house from the water. It's something that people in cities nowadays, we just don't get to experience. We get most of our food from supermarkets. I would love to live in Thailand. I love the idea of having a place in Thailand on a river somewhere, growing my own fruit and vegetables, raising my own fish or catching my own fish. I'd love to do that someday. It's November and the start of the dry season in Thailand. As the water levels in the river drop, it becomes much harder for people here to make a living planting rice or catching fish. But even as the river recedes, it gives birth to new ways of harvesting from the land. My journey continues on Thailand's other mighty river that planted the seeds of Thai civilization over 4,000 years ago. This is the Mekong River. It's one of the largest rivers in the world. It flows for over 4,000 kilometers through six countries. China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It's beautiful here. It truly feels like one of the world's great rivers. It feels more wild, more remote. One of the reasons why the Mekong River is special is the way the river changes from season to season. In the dry season, there are places along the river where you could almost walk across. In the rainy season, the water level comes up by over 10 meters, flooding huge areas of swampland and forest. I've come here in the dry season to see how people have adapted to the changing cycles of the river. As the water levels drop, the fish catch becomes much smaller. But the Mekong leaves behind rich, fertile soil that sustains locals here throughout the dry season. Man, check this out, this is pretty cool. During the dry season, people plant vegetable gardens on the exposed riverbank. You can see long bean, lettuce, cabbage, tomatoes, cucumbers, all in this one plot. Everywhere I look, I still see fishermen casting their nets. So I join a local fisherman, Lung Son, to find out how even at this time of year, people manage to catch fish. First up, the quintessential cast net. Just like that. <laughs> it, it looks easy, but it's complicated. So the idea of a cast net, you sort of twist your body, you throw it out, the net expands into a large circle and then drops in the water and sinks down, trapping whatever fish are below the water. Yeah, but it's gonna sink into the, the river. What, how do I? Okay, here we go. You ready? Okay, one, two, three. Oh, <laughs> I caught a boat. <laughs> Lung Son tells me that because the catch is smaller in the dry season, fishermen will hedge their bets and set up a whole bunch of different traps. This is a funnel-shaped trap made with bamboo, and there are some strings inside the trap. 
when the fish swims into the trap, it rubs up against the string, tripping the trap door and trapping the fish inside. We set the trap to check back on later. Next, Loon Son and I retrieve the gill net he set last night. We'll just move along the net from one end to the other, lifting it up and feeling for fish. I don't feel anything yet. Oh. Feel something? Oh, here's a fish. Nice. Check it out. Look at this. Decent sized fish. Oh, got one. Yeah, okay. you happy? Yeah. <laughs> this is good size. Probably one kilo, about two pounds, two or three pounds. Yeah, mate. Funny, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. So this is big. This is big for him. Our final stop is back at our fish trap. Let's see what we got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> one, fish. one small guy. Oh, you're, so you make fermented fish? So this kind of fish he uses to make a local delicacy around here, fermented fish or fermented fish paste. Lucky me, Lung Son brought along a sample. So this is a jar of fermented fish. This fish here, once it's salted and spiced, it could sit for as long as a year. <laughs> it's a full-bodied taste. It's really um, <laughs> salty. So he's saying that the longer it sits, the better it tastes. So you think about a cheese or a fine wine. And the longer it sits, the more full-bodied it gets. It's fascinating to see at any moment, whether it's the wet or the dry season, people here have learned to make the best of a situation. The Mekong River is the rice bowl of Asia, and I really get the sense that people eat, pray, love, and live with the ebb and flow of the Mekong River. Over the centuries, the Thais have harmonized their lives with the seasons. In recent years, though, dams built upriver have made the flow of water highly unpredictable disrupting the river's ecology and affecting people's livelihoods. So to make sure that they can survive when times get tough, the Thai Department of Fisheries worked out a solution. I'm heading to the Chiang Rai Fisheries Research Center to find out how they're engineering the nation's huge supply of fish. Inside this pond are tilapia, an African freshwater fish known for its quick growth and plentiful meat. It's probably the most popular cultured fish in Thailand. About 200,000 tons of tilapia are produced in Thailand every year. And the process for breeding them is quite unusual. The breeding program is part of a royal initiative in Thailand. There you go. Tilapia is an easy aquaculture fish, but to maximize their yield, researchers use an extraordinary trick to rear them. Wow. Dormia. Dormia. Oh, wow. The female fish, their mouths is filled with eggs. So these fish actually keep the fertilized eggs in their mouth. This is a process that I've never seen before. And so what we're doing is we're 
removing these young fish from the mouth of the adults as part of the breeding process. So how do we get the eggs out of the mouth? Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, that's crazy. So just shaking the eggs out of the fish's mouth. Oh, here. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, two or 300 young fish in one adult's mouth. The whole point of this process is to collect the young fry and introduce hormones into their feed to change the sex of the fish to male. Male tilapia grow much quicker and larger than females, which equals more fish for farmers to eat or sell. This center is an amazing example of just how much Thai people rely on fish and water. And it's this sense of connection that has led to the call to preserve the country's wild water havens. I'm heading back to the Central Plains to look at a conservation project at the heart of Thailand's river systems. Right now I'm out on a huge expanse of water. It's a big lake that's part of Thailand's largest wetland. It's called Bung Borapet. And it's close to where four of Thailand's rivers come together to form the Chao Phraya. And historically, this is a location that was used for hunting and fishing. But more recently, it's been protected as a national park. I'm here with Som Sak Tong Hoon from the fisheries department to find out more about why this place is so important. ตรงเนี้ยช่วงหน้าน้ําให้เข้ามาให้ลูกปลาเข้ามาเจริญเติบโตซึ่งจะสัมพันธ์กับช่วงหน้ามันก็พอปลาโตก็จะหนาวพอ